Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be back with you again because today I'm talking about a topic that is extremely dear to my heart and probably one of the most important differentiating factors in outcome as far as IVF is concerned. It's also one that people have different ideas on. There are different ways of going about it because it has to do with selecting the appropriate and ideal protocol for ovarian stimulation. And let me tell you from the outset, there's no f a single protocol that works for everyone when you choose an approach to stimulating women with IVF. No more than there's a, a single height or weight for any individual. When it comes to selecting the protocol for ovarian stimulation in IVF, you have to be individualized and strategic and you need to be very resolute about its implementation. And we're going to deal with that because this entire topic today will deal with the process that I use to select the ideal protocol on an individualized basis for my patients. But before I start, let me say, when it comes to IVF, we, people do things in different ways. Oftentimes it's well thought out, other times not so well thought out. The basic principle is to make your choices and decisions based upon scientific criteria and then more than anything else upon seasoning and experience. There's nothing we do in IVF today that can be proven beyond a doubt through randomized gold standard statistical testing. When we do randomized statistical testing to see if one approach is better than the other, we need to keep all of the factors involved in the process, all the variables stable, and then simply change one this way or that way. But all the other factors have to be stabilized. That is absolutely impossible to do in IVF because there's so many variables involved. They involve the medications, they involve the configurations, they involve timing of the doses, they involve the doctor and his skill set. They involve, there are hundreds of things moving at all times. It's impossible to keep them stabilized. And that is why when it comes to doing IVF and choosing a, a selected course of action, it's based upon experience, seasoning, and of course, unfortunately, many mistakes along the way. This is the one area where you learn from mistakes and hopefully every time you make a mistake, without it being deliberate, of course, but when you make a mistake, you learn from it and move on. This is a true art-science blend. Now, let me tell you a story because I come from Africa and this story best explains what I mean. When elephants migrate to greener pastures in the drought or in summer seasons, they do so safely for thousands of miles often to get where they're headed. And none of them are lost along the way because they seasoned in doing so. They've been doing it for millennia. I'm pretty sure that in the beginning when it started, many of them fell off cliffs or they went in the wrong direction or died along the way. But through repeatedly doing it over and over again, they certainly don't need guidance. Instinctively, through seasoning, they know how to go and where to travel. It's the same with IVF. You have to use basic knowledge and scientific principles and around it, fashion and experience, which you improve on over time. And hopefully with every ensuing month and year, the person performing the procedures and treatment should improve and get better on that basis. Again, IVF is not a pure science, not a pure art, and don't let anybody tell you that it is. It simply is not true. So let me get down to where I'm at with regard to my approach to dealing with patients that have got uh, to go onto a protocol of stimulation. How do I select it? And what is the, are the scientific principles upon which I base this? First, let me say that as women get older, the quality of their eggs automatically declines. It declines because of chromosomal changes in the egg. Although the sperm can also play a role 
in impacting the final chromosomal makeup of the embryo, which singularly is the most important factor in determining whether that embryo is viable or competent. The egg and not the sperm is the most important determinant. I would guess and say 70 to 80% of the factors determining whether an embryo is going to be competent to propagate a viable pregnancy and a healthy baby stems from the egg. And as I said, as a woman gets older, the egg declines in quality. In a woman in her late 20s and early 30s, one out of every two eggs is probably competent. When she gets to the age of 45, only one in 20 to 25 will be normal. So you can see that it declines, and it declines very rapidly in the late 30s and early 40s. If so few eggs are normal in women when they reach their mid-40s, little wonder that we would recommend to such women that rather than use their own eggs, they consider using the eggs of a young, healthy, and fertile donor. So the general rule is that up to the age 42 and maybe up to 43, using your own eggs is a, is a probably prefer, preferred approach. But after that, you should really not be using own eggs. Now, women have had babies with their own eggs through IVF up to the age of close to 50. I remember one such woman, I'll just call her Maureen, and if you're watching Maureen, you'll know who I'm talking about. Maureen came to me at the age of 48, and she wanted to have a baby with her own eggs, and she absolutely insisted on using her own eggs. Using a donor was not even an option. Believe me, it was with great resistance that I went that way. In fact, I never even charged her, I felt so guilty. But the truth is that she absolutely insisted. After six tries, Maureen conceived and gave birth to a child that was given my name. I'm the, I'm the godfather of that child, proudly so. And I get letters from her every year around Christmas time and New Year with pictures of the family. Makes me feel very good. But the truth is that Maureen is a rare example. And to my knowledge, she gave birth at the age of 49. That is the oldest woman, to my knowledge, that's ever given birth through IVF using her own eggs. I could be wrong, but that's my, my, to my knowledge. If there are others, they far and few and far in between. So it's not something I want to suggest as an approach to others that are older in their late 40s to even consider. But it goes again to prove one basic phenomenon. Man proposes, God disposes. So that's the important thing. We don't make the determination as to who's going to have a baby and when. That's a God-given miracle, a wonderful miracle. Okay, so the egg is the important factor because automatically, as women get older, egg quality declines. That means you need access to more eggs at a time when the woman's running out of eggs. Because the second issue is that as she gets closer to the menopause, her egg population declines. We call that her ovarian reserve declines. And we measure the ovarian reserve in the woman's blood today primarily by measuring a hormone known as anti-Mullerian hormone, AMH. The normal layer can be measured anywhere in the cycle. But if the anti-mullerian hormone is over 2 nanograms per milliliter or 15 picomoles per liter if you're in Canada or Europe, it's normal. And the woman should still have lots of eggs available and should easily respond to fertility drugs to access those eggs. But once the AMH drops below 1.5 and then below 1, the woman has diminished ovarian reserve. And in those circumstances, she will need a completely modified approach, more aggressive, more drugs, and more individualization with regard to the stimulation approach. Then when we get the eggs from her, if the woman happens to be older, there's an imperative to make sure that when the egg fertilizes and makes an embryo, that we test that embryo to make sure that it's competent that has got all 23 pairs or 46 total 
chromosomes intact. And this is done through a process which proudly I was among the first to introduce in the early part of the century called pre-implantation genetic screening with full chromosomal analysis or full chromosomal karyotyping. So PGS can help us identify which embryos are the ones that are more likely to make a baby. Little point here, when the egg fertilizes and then divides to make an embryo and goes on to day five or day six to reach the blastocyst stage, where it's over 100 cells, if an embryo doesn't reach the blastocyst stage, it is incompetent. You don't want it. Putting it back earlier will not have improved matters. You often hear people say, put the embryo back earlier, and in this way, it gets into a natural environment where it can grow better. That's a fallacy. It's not true. An embryo that doesn't make it to the blastocyst stage, the expanded blastocyst stage, by no later than day six after fertilization, is almost always incompetent, and you wouldn't have needed it anyway, which raises the question, why wouldn't we take all embryos to blastocyst? Who are we kidding by putting them back earlier? The only person that's helping is really the doctor. Because the doctor can say, look, I transferred an embryo to you. We did succeed. You didn't succeed because it wasn't our fault but yours. The truth is that you have got to take the embryo to the point where you know it's got the best possible chance of making a baby. And if none of them made it, you wouldn't have gotten pregnant anyway. If none of them made it to blastocyst by day six. That's an extremely important consideration. It's changed the whole way I look at IVF. Very rarely do I put embryos back earlier than blastocyst. Now, in some cases, if a woman's only got one embryo or two, and she says, I don't want to wait five or six days, I want to get the embryo put back now, I'll do it. It's her right. Because the truth is, if you put the embryo in earlier or later, it still has the overall best chance or same chance of making a baby. So I would put it back earlier, but my preference is always to take the embryos, let them prove that they have the best potential by reaching blastocyst. But even when they reach blastocyst, that doesn't mean that they're totally competent. Simply because it reached blastocyst doesn't mean they're all normal chromosomally. You have to do pre-implantation genetic screening. And that technology is changing to the point now where it's going to become soon completely non-invasive. We won't even have to biopsy the embryos. We'll just be able to sample the fluid that it grows in, test the DNA, and know if the embryo is normal. And I'll talk about that at a later date. So the general introduction here is that the embryo is primarily a function of egg competency. And now we get to the factors, because this is where it affects the way you choose your protocol for stimulation. What affects the ability of an egg to develop normally and then ultimately mature into a healthy, uh, um, mature egg that has a perfect number of 23 chromosomes at the point you subject it to fertilization. Well, the most important thing that affects the egg in its development, other than the woman's age, and you can't reverse that aspect of the biological clock, the only other factor is the environment in which the eggs develop in the ovary. Let me give you another simple analogy. If I grow a plum tree in my backyard and I grow at the dark end of the garden where there's not a lot of sunshine and irrigation, the plums are not going to taste good. If, the, if you regard your eggs as your plums and your ovaries as your plum trees, it's obvious the ovary has to be nurturing those uh, plums as they grow those eggs. And therefore, the ovary has to be, uh, in, there has to be an environment in the ovary which is conducive to normal egg development. The second principle is that if an egg doesn't develop normally up to the point that it ripens, and the ripening of the egg, like the plum on the tree, is a short process of final fine-tuning of all those processes that have developed preceding that so that they will ultimately be optimal with regard to function. You take the plum off the tree, you put it in the window shelf, it ripens, and if it looks good, you hope it's going to taste good. But it'll only taste good if it developed perfectly until you plucked it off the tree, put it in the window shelf to ripen. 
Same with eggs. If they don't develop properly until you give the woman the trigger shot with HCG or a similar product to ripen it and take it into meiosis. Because in the ensuing 36 hours, from the moment you give the woman that HCG trigger, that egg will then halve its chromosome number, or it's, the objective is that it halves its chromosome number from 46 down to 23. Only an egg with exactly 23 chromosomes that's been through this maturational division called meiosis at the point it's extracted or ovulates will be able to produce a viable pregnancy and a healthy baby. If there's one more or one less than that, or even more than one or less than, uh, or more than two less or more, then that egg will not make a good embryo. The embryo won't attach or detach very briefly as a miscarriage or chemical pregnancy, or if you're very unlucky and it's an abnormal embryo, it'll produce a birth defect, such as Downs. So for, with all of that background, it's important to understand that getting the egg through this process all the way up to the point you give the trigger, where it's developing, is a critical phase of the stimulation process. So what is it that makes the egg not develop normally? There are many factors. One of them is the hormone testosterone. My wife always jokes and she says testosterone is the root of all evil. Of course, that's discrimination against men. But the truth of the matter is that testosterone is the building block from which the follicle will make estrogen. And if there's enough, just enough testosterone, the follicle will be able to have the best potential to grow normally and produce a normal egg. But if there's too much testosterone, the testosterone will get into the fluid of the follicle, compromise its development, and also the development of the egg that is attached to the inner wall of the follicle. And the result will be that you'll end up with an egg that is more likely to be incompetent, have an irregular quota of chromosomes once it's gone through this maturational division of the HCG trigger, and such an egg is termed aneuploid. And the embryo it produces when the sperm comes along, also with 23 chromosomes to fertilize it, if that embryo has got more than or less than 46 chromosomes, it is likewise aneuploid. And as I stated, an aneuploid embryo won't make a healthy offspring. So what is it then that is responsible for testosterone production. What is important for testosterone production is the production by the pituitary gland of luteinizing hormone or LH. LH is produced by the pituitary gland, it goes to the ovary, causes the connective tissue around the follicle, known as the stroma or theca, to produce testosterone. There cannot be too much testosterone, there's got to be a little bit but not a lot. Too much is dangerous to egg development. It'll compromise development and have a far greater likelihood that the resulting egg will be incompetent or aneuploid, the embryo aneuploid, and the exercise of IVF a failure. So what then can result in too much LH that'll cause the ovary to overproduce testosterone? Well, the first is ovarian reserve, which we spoke about earlier. If a woman's got a low AMH, and she, is, she will automatically have LH in increased, with increased quantity or biological activity. The older she gets, the more likely it is for her LH to become more potent and have more biological activity. So if the LH level is too high, or the biological activity of the LH is too great, as is more likely to occur in women with diminished ovarian reserve, and especially if she's older on top of it, then the result is that you'll end up with too much testosterone effect, compromised egg development, compromise the quality of the eggs that are, that are harvested, the quality of the embryo, and compromise the outcome of the IVF. So you've got to keep LH at a low level. There are also certain medical conditions where there's an overproduction of LH by the ovary. One of them is a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, where that stroma or theca, the connective tissue around the follicles that produces testosterone, 
is thickened and there's much more of it. We call that hypothecosis or stromal hyperplasia and it's usually due to too much LH which is typical in women with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. They overproduce LH, so they overproduce testosterone. Little wonder that we often get such a high percentage of abnormal eggs when we do IVF or when we stimulate women who've got PCOS. It's all if you leave the testosterone level unchecked. Another situation where there's too much LH is when you use a drug called um, clomiphene or clomid or seraphine or you use a drug called letrozole. They, call, they expunge LH out of the pituitary along with FSH. The FSH is good for follicle growth, but the LH causes too much testosterone. And that's why Clomid is one of the reasons why these drugs, Clomiphene, Femara, Letrozole, do not give re good results in older women. They only work well in younger women. So that's another reason not to, in my opinion, use Clomiphene or Letrozole, in my opinion, in IVF. Especially when IVF is done in older women. And that is one of the reasons I'm against this concept of mini-IVF where doctors tell you they can use lower dosages to keep a more natural and subdued environment for stimulation and not stress the eggs. Guess who they use that on? Mini IVF is often advocated for older women and women with diminished ovarian reserve, exactly where it's the worst to do. Because these are women who've got high LH activity and fewer eggs. So I never do mini IVF at all. I think it is a pipe dream. I think it gives people false hope, and it sounds good, but it's not good. The heavier the weight you pick off the floor, the more effort you've got to expend. The same applies the fewer eggs, the poorer the ovarian reserve, the higher the dosage, the more forceful and robust your stimulation needs to be. So then, with that in mind, how do we or how do I recommend people be stimulated. I'm very much in favor of a protocol that lowers LH before the cycle begins and then maintains and perpetuates a low level of LH throughout the stimulation. And the way that I do that is I put my patients on a birth control pill. I call this a long pituitary down regulation protocol and I use a birth control pill which is a monophasic pill has estrogen and progesterone, not a pill where the levels of estrogen and progesterone change throughout the month. The birth control pill suppresses LH and it gives the ovaries a breather. While on the pill, I then overlap the woman's pill, the birth control pill, for three days with an agonist such as Lupron, Superfact, Bucerolin, Nafarelin, gonopeptil, there are a whole bundle of them. But I use Lupron for three days. Then I stop the pill, continue giving the Lupron, and the period will come within five to six days thereof. The moment the 